And I think being in a band was great prepar preparation for being an entrepreneur because you, know, you have a lot of the same ingredients. You've got to manage a group of people. It's a creative process. Everybody's poor. <laughs> a long and winding road. So it, I started t a little over 10 years ago as a recommendation technology, thinking that we would build this music genome project and then make the technology available to other websites and services, et cetera, at, at the then booming online music e-commerce world. And uh, we chased after that business for about four years uh, as a licensor of technology built the core application, analyzed a ton of music into this database. And then about four years in, we completely shifted direction and repurposed all that work into uh, the radio service, which eventually launched as Pandora, renamed the company and, and launched in the fall of 2005 as a web radio and you know, just took off like a rocket ship. Well, yeah, I pitched hundreds, over 300 VCs over the course of those two and a half years or so, which was pretty disheartening. Um, I think that uh, you know, for me personally, I, I was fed just enough fuel over that time, you know, some positive feedback here, a little business deal here, some signals to me that, you know, we weren't just treading water, we were going in some direction. It was just enough for me to kind of fortify myself so that I could in turn, you know, lead and inspire the team. Because the team, if you don't genuinely believe in what you're doing, eventually your team will see through that and, and will, you know, I think jump ship. But I always believed in it. I, uh, and, and, and those signals helped me remain uh, very um, genuine in my commitment to it. And I was able to convey that, I think, effectively. And uh, because I believe that, it, it, it allowed me to take some pretty crazy risks, you know, to get pretty far out on the limb uh, to keep the company going, you know, running up credit card debt and all that nonsense. Because uh, I had enough belief that we were going to get there eventually, that this, this bridge was not going to turn into a pier, you know. Uh, and I was able to, I think, inspire people enough, my own confidence in it, to, to ha hang on. And then 2004 rolled around, we raised you know, our first big round of investment. And at that point, there was a bunch of new people in the boat, you know, fresh new blood, new believers, a new team. And that was just like a huge injection of energy. And at that point, the, the sort of burden and the worry got shared. And that was a, you know, everything just completely changed then. Well, I find every day now, I, I kind of pinch myself when I look around, whether I'm with the company and I'm in a room with 150 employees, or I'm speaking at a conference, or I'm uh, presenting to an ad agency about a big advertising deal we're doing. I just am constantly kind of, I have this constant nagging thought in the back of my head that maybe this is all not real, that you know I'm gonna suddenly wake up and be back in the earlier years. So I have this kind of sense of um, unreality about it, in a way. At the same time, I enjoy it really profoundly because I've been on the completely opposite space. Yeah, we, the, this, this journey has been a really tough one. Uh, for, for many years, I, I was kind of terrified by what I thought was happening to the business, uh, the risks, the, the, what seemed like impending failure of it, and also all the investment everybody had made around me, you know, with time and working for free and all these things, and I, and I felt a tremendous sense of responsibility. And, and I think uh, I, I learned as a leader to kind of compartmentalize that and make sure that that didn't show up at work uh, so that I could lead and inspire people around me. Uh, I absorbed a lot of that stress, which is not good for you. And I think if you're an entrepreneur, you have to prepare yourself, you know, steal yourself for that experience. Because unless you're very, very lucky and wind up on this kind of uh, 
fast trajectory, you're gonna wind up spend, you know, climbing the wall of worry for some duration. And uh, I just think I'll never stop believing in the basic idea. Uh, I really had faith that it was a good idea and that it would eventually find its day. I just need to hang on long enough and surrounded myself with really good, dedicated people that were willing to kind of hang on with me um, to get through it. I mean, absent, there were 50 people who worked for nothing for a long time. It was, you know, this was a big team sacrifice. So I learned to rely on other people, uh, but also kind of keep my own concerns and worries really kind of out of the office. Yeah, that's a good question. I, when we first hired people, we had no idea what we were going to get into. So I'm, I don't know that at the time I thought to myself, oh, is this the kind of person who will be able to last if things get tough? I think, though, if you, if you hire people who you feel, one, believe in what you're doing, two, have very, very high integrity, uh, and, uh, and three, are not averse to risk, are adventurers, uh, then I think once you have that, it's up to you to inspire them. You know, it's up to you to kind of give them a reason to keep going. Uh, that's where leadership comes in. But I think those are the sort of basic ingredients. It's hard to predict how someone's going to change or function under times of extreme stress. It's very hard to know that. Well, I think there are a lot of dynamics at play in that sort of crucible. Uh, I think you have, people did believe in the idea, and I think that was sort of a, a, a cornerstone of their uh, tenacity that they, that they, everybody, no matter how things, how bad things got, thought they were part of something really interesting and cool, important, and valuable, and that we were, it was a lot to do with timing and our position in the market. So I think that was, that was sort of a constant. And then I think what happens is, um, after a while, your, your willingness to commit and stay is more about uh, kind of loyalty to each other than it is necessarily to the company as an entity or the product. It's, it's more, you know, you, you've been sitting side by side with people for a long time. You're all in the same boat. You're all experiencing the same external stresses and all the same worries, but you're all sacrificing, and I think you feel a sense of obligation. That was a huge thing for me. I, I felt a huge sense of obligation. And, and either the team comes together around that, and the, it's like everybody grab an oar, let's keep this boat moving so we stay afloat, or you know, you scatter. Uh, so I think that you know, we, we had the belief in the idea, we had the sense of camaraderie, and then we had just enough signs of success, just enough signs of hope, glimmers of hope, over the course of those years to have some external validation that what we were doing was worth something. And I think if you're, when you're really huddled in your bunker trying to build something and you believe in an idea, it's really hard if you have nobody outside the company telling you this is a good decision. But we were able to license this technology to a handful of people, uh, win some bake-offs, get some external validation, get a little bit of money coming in from customers, and that was a really, really key third-party validation you know, for me, for the employees, for the idea, and ultimately for investors. You know, I, so there, I think there are two things that are, to me, the cornerstones to, to s surviving as an entrepreneur. I think one is setting up a sustainable life for yourself. So you have to work really hard, you have to take all these risks, you have to, you know, commit yourself whole, wholeheartedly to something. But set your life up personally and professionally and physically, emotionally, etc., so that it's sustainable, so that you can last for a long time. You, you, you can't, I think, do something where you're just driving yourself into a wall. You have to find a way to make it sustainable. And I think the second thing, which is, to me, was, was the best piece of advice I ever got from my wife, came from my wife, which was don't be self-conscious about being an entrepreneur. And I think one of the hardest things when you're an entre entrepreneur, especially when you're struggling, is you start to feel like a fool. You start to feel like, gosh, you know, did I make a huge mistake? 
uh, am I wasting my life, am I wasting these years, all my friends are off doing things that are much more predictable and stable, am I, you know, am I going to be five, ten years from now and be forty-something and feel like, oh my god, you know, I just missed a decade of my life and I have nothing to show for it. And you have to ask people for money all the time, you're, you know, borrowing constantly. And I think it's very easy to become self-conscious and feel like you're, you know, you're a leech. And if you do that, you're in deep trouble. And, and you just can't let that happen. Well, I really internalized that notion of not being self-conscious. I said to myself, you know what? I need to borrow money. That's right. I need to borrow money. Great companies are built by people who borrowed money. At some point, they said to someone, I know I'm asking you for a favor, but you're going to, I'm going to reward you for that favor. And just fundamentally believe that these people who are helping you now, you will help them later. That, that, that'll be a good investment for them. And I really, I believe that. And if you really believe that, then you're able to communicate that effectively uh, to the many, many audiences you have to sort of sell it to. I think that uh, entrepreneurs uh, need in their core team a salesperson. They need to have someone who can, you know, tell the story, inspire people, uh, sell the product, the vision, the whatnot. You need someone who can do that. You may not be able to do that yourself, that's fine, but find someone who really has a gift for, you know, getting someone's pulse racing about your idea. Because you need that in so many ways uh, to sort of, you know, kick your company up above the threshold. There's, it's a two it's a two sided coin what we're after one is the the providing an individual with this wonderful musical experience so giving someone the joy of listening to music they love and discovering music and that kind of fundamental emotional uh, experience and just being you know uh, uh, really really uh, focused on that. The second thing is respecting and supporting the artists that create the music. So remembering that for us to be successful as a business writ large, we have to be helping artists and supporting the artist community and helping to develop sort of a musician's middle class, whatever you want to call it. And so don't make any decisions that compromise that in any way. You know, don't play fast and loose with copyright. Uh, be fair to all musicians. Uh, and the same way with listeners, be personal. Interact with people. Listen to their complaints, engage with, you know, be human. Uh, and those two things are the cornerstones of what Pandora is. I think that the, it's a great luxury for us that we have a very simple, concise focus, which is this music experience, the, the relationship between individual and music. It's, it's a really nice, clear target for the company to aim at. And and I think, you know, inside Pandora, we really do, it's a mantra for us. When we, when we do everything from how we prioritize features to how we communicate with the public, you know, to, to sort of how we shape the business, it's actually very much informed by how do we sort of honor that very specific interaction between a, a, a music lover and music and, you know, the musician. It, it, it provides us a great sort of focusing mechanism. I think it's, I think every company needs to find that and write it down.